Today we are talking about size, mistakes made during rep season and the origin of the academy. I think that's what we're talking about. Yes, how the academy came about. Welcome to episode 18 of Run It Straight. All right, question one. Hi, I'm 17 years old and 176 centimeters. I play second row. Am I too small to play in the NRL? Um, and that is, we get that a lot. We do get that. We do get that a lot. Uh, that's one of those, it depends. It um, really does depend. Question, uh, I would say educate yourself about playing sizes and we're gonna get to that in a minute. Um, you know, there's an old saying that knowledge is power. Um, but the correct interpretation of that quote is that applied knowledge is power. So it's all well and good to have information, but you need to use those informations, use that information to actually make better decisions in a particular situation. Um, so that being said, how do we get the information? There's the internet, you go to Google and you literally type in NRL player heights. So I will get Spiro to put a link to this in the show notes or maybe like up the top here somewhere where I'm pointing. Um, Spiro, see, up here. Yeah, good boy. Um, which, and we're gonna look at those in a minute. Um, okay, now a couple of things. Some kids grow early, some kids, some kids grow late, and obviously we see the same thing with a lot of boys coming in. Um, different background players uh, often can have growth spurts at different ages, but the scientific consensus is fairly clear that generally speaking, and there are always exceptions, uh, people, uh, boys are done growing by the age of 16. That will give you a very nice sum. I'm gonna go a little bit uh, later than that, there's going to be a few that are going to be a little bit earlier. But if you're at 16, and let's say you're measuring your height, and you said, how old to you? 176. And if you've been 176 for six or seven or eight months, that's probably going to be it. Um, uh, so more than likely you're done growing. And you may well be too short to play in the second row. Now, on that link, I will run through to give you a little bit of an idea currently in the NRL. So if you Google that, there will be a, um, on zero tackle, it has player heights both in centimetres and inches, and it literally tells you every single player in the NRL, and it tells you how tall they are, um, at least as, as, as long as we can trust the data that the clubs um, are putting forward, which generally speaking, you can. So at 176 centimetres, we have Mitch Rain. <coughs> at 177, we go up. Um, Jaden Beryl, Tom Dearden, Jamal Fogarty, Harry Grant, Albert Kelly, Cameron McInnes, Anthony Milford, Kevin Naguama, uh, Reese Walsh, Connor Watson. Okay, so there you go. Connor Watson, he slots between, what, fullback, hooker, 5'8", but he plays a little bit of lock yeah. occasionally. But he's more of a utility. He's a utility player. Yep. Um, and he's a 177, so that's a centimetre taller than you. We go a little bit shorter, 175, Aaron Booth, Reed Marnie, Tyrone Roberts, 174, Cody Nicarima, Jaden Sutherland, 173, Adam Reynolds, 172, Adam Clune, Jake Granville, um, Coruscant, Tom Starling. Uh, most of those players, in fact, none of those players are playing, uh, and if I come back, what was it, second row he said he was playing? Yeah, there's, there, there aren't any second rowers that are at that height in the NRL. Um, and this is a conversation that we have to have, how many times have we talked to, to players and or their parents about this? It's a tough conversation to have, um, and it is very confronting when it first, uh, when you first hear it, uh, especially when I first heard of it as well, when I was playing centre and I was 175 centimetres. Um, Joe broke me the news. Mm. Uh, I wasn't too <laughs> thrilled and I thought he was wrong. Um, I now know better. Yeah, but when you look at the numbers, the numbers don't lie. And look, it's one of those things that you might, you might have a kid who's always been big and strong and powerful, right from, you know, under nines, under tens, he was always one of the big strong kids right through and then, and, and you know, still at under 14s dominating. 15s, he's strong, but you know, there's a few bigger boys around him. You get to under 16s and all of a sudden he's definitely not one of the big boys um, at all anymore. And then 17s and you wouldn't pick him out from a crowd as being larger than anyone else. And that's, that's just the way that it is. And we need to deal with the reality of the situation. It doesn't mean you can't keep playing second row or lock and enjoy your footy. Um, but if you do have designs on going further, you might need to start to look like we were talking about um, 
at being, if it's, if it's your 176, it might be 175, 176, as someone who can slot into hooker and can play at lock, or someone who is a utility. Um, the advice that I would give is perhaps a change of position is on the cards, number one. If you don't want to go down that path, then you know an alternate um, view on the situation is you just need to get very, very, very good. Uh, now, there's, there's, there's an old saying that applies to young players playing NRL, um, and that is if you're good enough, you're old enough, right? Um, but the same quote can be applied to, uh, you could say, small players, that if you're good enough, you're big enough. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of very, very lightweight players that are running around even right now. You know, there's, you know a strong breeze would knock Pappenhausen over, um, but he's absolutely phenomenal. Again, though, he's not quite that short. Um, I don't know how tall he is. Do you know how tall he is? I don't, actually. I think he's at 179, is he, or 180? Um, uh, uh, 170. The bottom line is, it, unless you're that X factor at that height, it's going to be incredibly hard to make that position. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you would get overlooked, even though you have the same talent, or if, if not a bit more than the other person that makes it over you, the fact that he's that little bit taller will always give him the uh, priority over you. 181 centimetres. Yeah. So you look at him and you think, yeah, he's small. Um, he's definitely light, but he's 181 centimetres. Now, uh, to play devil's advocate and look at the other side of the equation, um, which we like to do, sport is full of people who didn't match the metrics of, of what that particular sport is. Um, if we look at Lionel Messi's 170 centimetres, he's a very little guy. Um, Soccer player for all of you rugby league players who don't know who he is. The average player in his position, the average, not, not like the, the tall guys, the average player in his position is 180 centimetres. But he's probably renowned as one of the best players of the last 30 or 40 years. But his skill level is next level. So this is what we're saying is you need to be really, really good. If we look at um, Alan Langer, mm. uh, was 165 centimetres. You know, nearly 10 centimetres shorter than basically the shortest guy in the NRL. Um, maybe eight centimetres shorter than. And he's probably the best halfback that Queensland's ever have. I guess you could make an argument for Thurston, um, but not very tall, ridiculously skillful, and controlled games, man of the matches, all of those um, accolades that came his way. So we end up saying a lot of the same things. You need to get better. And if you're smaller than that, that gap to make up for your lack of the physicality needs to be even better. Um, but question, being, am I too small to play in the NRL? No, there's plenty of guys at 176, but are you too small to play as a second rower? Possibly. Yeah, unless there's some crazy X factor that we don't know about. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, I think that kind of brings that one too. Next question. Um, hey guys, I was wondering what your personal background was with footy training in the academy. What mistakes did you make and how would you do things differently if you had your time over? Um, <clears throat> this can be a very long answer. I think uh, this week we might talk about Chris's background and we'll talk about the academy. Um, and then maybe uh, next episode we might talk uh, about my background a bit. Um, so Chris, background with football, some mistakes made, some lessons learnt. Plenty of them. All right, let's, let, let's, let's hit it, away we go. Okay, so <coughs> I... Uh, Started playing with St. John's Eagles uh, when I was five. Canterbury Comp. Canterbury Comp. Uh, I stayed there the whole time. Same team, same club. Um, we won a few grand finals together. It was great. And made the Harold Matthews squad with Bulldogs, development squad and Harold Matthews squad. Um, beyond that, I think what happened was I was at a, a knockout comp and I got scouted to go to Cronulla. SG Ball. He's um, not a Bulldogs fan, by the way, just so you know. So it wasn't I'm not like a Bulldogs fan. Busy, so that's the yeah, least favourite club. Paramount. Just putting that out there. Um, <laughs> my nemesis. But I'll still play for him. It's okay. Yeah, so uh, at some stage I got um, scouted. So I went over to the Cronulla comp, had a breakout year, uh, made the SG Ball uh, Cronulla side. And uh, that's where the mistakes, I think, happens for me. So... Um, it was around about that age where you want to hang out with your mates a lot. So um, that's what I wanted to do rather than putting extra work, uh, extra training. 
So just rocking up on time, leaving on time, uh, instead of putting the extra work before and after. So guys, when we're talking about these things with you all the time, this is because this does come from personal experience, okay? We understand completely. You know, we're obviously, I'm much older, but you know, we were your age and we understand what all of those pressures and the things that you wanna do are, but we've also seen it happen that many times. So we understand if you wanna be successful, we understand the kinds of things that you need to do to be successful. Sorry, keep going, Chris. Will do. Um, so one of the major things that happened for me in my breakout year was uh, the SG board trial. Um, I was tapped on the shoulder and told that I didn't have to go too hard because I was already in the team. I think that was the worst thing that could have happened because I, I didn't go as hard and I ended up dislocating my knuckle, um, which I then hid from my coach because I knew SG ball season is only about eight or nine weeks long. Um, and I would be out for the majority of that season. So I tried to play on, uh, hide it, uh, train and play with a subluxed knuckle. So it's gone out of the joint and come back in. So next lesson, which we've talked about before, when you get hurt, do not hide it from the coach. You've got to go and tell the coach and the coaching staff. Um, because you'll, you'll make the same mistakes. Oh, well, I don't want to lose my spot and I don't want to lose this. Well, it's not going to work out well if you're injured and you don't play well and then you get dropped. And they think it's because of your ability rather than be, because of an injury. And every time one of the, the players that we do look after, that we do train, when they're in that situation and they, and they ignore our advice and they don't tell the coach, and then when the coach or the trainer or the physio finds out, um, they, they cop it. Uh, because they're like, you've got to let us know. We need to make the best decision. Um, we need to help you. We can rehab it. We can get you back faster so you're actually going to play it at your ability. So that's lesson number two. Yeah. So at that stage, obviously, you're young. You don't, you don't think it's a big deal. It's like, oh, it's just a sore hand. You'll be okay. Uh, I eventually got scans on it. Uh, X-rays came back clean, so I continued playing. Um, but eventually when uh, I got found out that I actually had an injury when I uh, grimaced, in a tackle, um, I, w I got sent for MRI scans, which confirmed that I had a sublux knuckle. Uh, and at that stage, I had to be sat out, did a bit of rehab, um, but it was it was almost healed. So I had about a week off or two, and then come back. Instead of playing center, my normal position, I started at wing um, and finished the season there. So that from a breakout season turned sour pretty quickly and that was um, to do with all the mistakes the decisions I made in that process. Mm. So in hindsight, I would definitely rock up earlier, train harder, uh, well, no, though, in saying that, I, when I was there, I was putting 100% effort. Um, even at the games, I was putting 100% effort, but I didn't do any extras. Yeah, and we always said, it's everything that you do when you're away from the field, even the things that you do when you're away from the team that's gonna make the, the difference, that's gonna separate you from everyone else. When everyone's there at training, everyone's doing what everyone's doing. Um, but it's when everyone's not there. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's five o'clock in the morning on, on, on a Saturday or a Sunday morning when you've got nothing on and you're like, yeah, you know what, I'll just sleep in a little bit. And out of that 25 boys, there's one or two who get up and train and they're the ones that they're looking at for flag contracts and moving through to Cup and to the NRL. It's not the guy who decides to have the sleep in. Yeah. And mind you, one thing that I will put out there, uh, part of the reason why I probably didn't do the extras is because um, I had more of a, I guess you could say, the natural talent, um, but I also had a crazy work ethic when I was uh, at training. So I was uh, pretty much the fittest in Bulldogs and SG Ball, so Harold Matthews and SG Ball. I was probably the fittest, uh, won every fitness conditioning exercise or training drill that we did. Um, and I did play with the likes of, uh, in Bulldogs, I played with uh, Daniel Tupo and uh, Aiden Caesar. Uh, SG Boer played with Tyrone Peachy and Chad Townsend, who are both, or well, they're all uh, well-known first grade footballers. Um, but yeah, on that note, again, make sure it doesn't matter how talented you are, you put in the extra work uh, before and after training and take injuries seriously, um, get the right treatment for it, be honest and open to your, your trainers and coaching and staff. And communicate with them, yeah, 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 100%. 100%. So what happened from there pretty much um, I think that played a major factor in me not making the 20 squad. Um, and at that stage, 20s was massive. That's when it was televised and NRL was pumping a lot of money into the, uh, that competition. Um, so the feedback that I did get was um, I needed to put on a bit more size. So I took the year off, which I, in previous uh, episodes you would have heard me say, that's a very bad idea uh, in hindsight. So don't take a year off footy. Um, you've got to stay in the game. 
mm. is my personal experience. So I've taken the year off, put on a lot of size, gotten qualified as a personal trainer. Um, that's when, uh, I guess, my world and Joe's world uh, collided. Um, we both worked at the same gym uh, for a, a while. And um, he actually, or Joe actually mentored me throughout it and uh, was giving me the right training schedules and so forth to put on that size. And so I did successfully put on size and then I played Bundy Cup, which is the same as Ron Massey Cup now. So Bundy Cup doesn't exist anymore, but it's the same level as Ron Massey Cup. Um, and that's when I've, I've realized that I was too short for my position, which was, uh, you know, as I was younger, I was a, a running 5'8". Then I got moved into center because I was a very strong runner of the ball um, and ran really good lines. So then I was playing center and wing um, bottom line was if I if I knew better I would have either stuck with the halves position with my height and had to get really really good at that um, or move to hooker which I eventually did for Bundy Cup um, I was playing quite well at Bundy Cup uh, I got nicknamed Pitbull because I would smash all the front rollers that would run <laughs> at me um, and, and then yeah, and then that's when I uh, subluxed my shoulder about between four to six times in one season. Um, rehabbed it properly the first time to get back in, happened in the next game and just kept playing because I knew if I had to rehab it again, I'd miss the rest of the season. By the end of that season, I made the decision to hang up the boots. Because um, yeah, you then, needed big surgery to fix it and it's correct. 18 months recovery or something. It would have been a long recovery. Yeah. Um, and that was at the time where I was actually looking to get uh, proposed to my, my girlfriend and who is now my wife. Um, so I chose a different course. But um, on that note, that's when I decided to go into uh, further into personal training. And uh, me and Joe, well, it, Joe came to me with the idea of the academy, which I absolutely loved. And I jumped at it because I made a whole bunch of mistakes in my, uh, my career, you could say. Um, which if I changed those decisions along the way, uh, things could have worked out differently. Could or could not have, but I could have given myself a better uh, opportunity yeah, 100%. in hindsight. And that's, that's where, like, I guess the origins of the Academy would we'll talk about my background, how I came into it next episode next week. But that's essentially what the origins of the Academy were, was, was his experience. I had a similar kind of experience. It was us, okay. Uh, number one, we'd been, I'd been in the industry, he'd been in the industry five, six years at that point, I think, um, yep. training people, um, and I'd probably been in the industry, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 years at that point, um, and I had a, lo a long uh, background and history of training myself even prior to going into the fitness industry, and I'd had my own set of mistakes and errors and things like that, and we wanted to try to make, to build what we wish we'd had access to, in hindsight, when we were 13 or 14 or 15 years of age and try to be that sense of, of reason that's a bit separate, that's not you know, emotionally involved like mum or dad would be um, and to try to give kids uh, a place to come to where they can see how good they can become as a footballer uh, and to help guide them. And it's not just about, because anyone who knows us knows us, yeah, oh, it's, it's the gym stuff. It's not just about the gym stuff, um, but it's about all the different facets um, of training as a rugby league player, but it goes even beyond that. It's about being able to develop the qualities uh, necessary that are going to make you successful in football, but they're going to end up making you successful in life. But, you know, more specifically, it's, you know, we do help the boys make decisions about where they, what clubs are going to play at. If that means that if they, if they move sideways and they go to a different club, if they're going to get to play, like we said, we had a question earlier on today about the guy who wanted to play in the second row. Let's say he wants to, you know, I still want to have a crack at the NRL. I still want to make it. Maybe I need to move to hooker. It's like, okay, well, let's look at a club next season to move to where, you know, their hooking role is not that strong. We see, is the coach a good coach? Um, is it a decent club? What level are they playing at? And then we look at helping that kid. Um, so it's about being able to make those decisions rather than just staying with you know the status quo and I'll just stay with this club that I've played with. And because we've seen kids that have come in that have been gifted um, and when we've made some of these suggestions, some of the ones who were, you know, oh, well, I've played with my mates since I was five and I'm now under 15s and the kids are good enough to play rep football, but they don't want to make that shift. And so, you know, they come, they train, they have some good seasons, they get to under 18s and then they, they kind of, oh, maybe I should have made that, that change of position or that change of club and they haven't. Um, and you know, even they, we can't convince everyone, but we can convince some people. So 
uh, I guess the academy came out of us trying to learn from our mistakes and trying to make a better situation for the next generation coming through. And you know, we're continually refining that and I think we're executing on what... I think what makes us uh, so different as well is we've got that we both have the, uh, the playing background yeah, um, as well as the uh, personal training, strength and conditioning background, mm -hmm. which we've then combined and, um, and created this academy. So uh, yeah, the reason why I jumped at the idea of opening the academy was um, to help uh, all the younger boys to actually train correctly. So uh, I trained weights from when I was about 13 to 15 years old. Um, but the kind of training that I was doing then compared to what I know now and yeah. what we implement is it's light and day, uh, night and day, sorry. So if you train properly from a young age, you can take your body to a level which you didn't think was possible. Um, so if we implement the right kind of training at a younger age um, and then stick with the right work ethic all yeah, the way the through, results are the phenomenal. Results, yeah, exactly. So um, if we had the academy when we were uh, younger, um, I mean, that's what we wish, right? We opened something that we wish we had when we were younger because it would make the, the biggest difference. Um, yeah, and you often see that, that people, uh, uh, people go into careers uh, looking to help people like themselves. Um, you see, you know, people with uh, psychiatric issues, they go into psychology because they understand it and they understand that there's a need for it and they're in a better position to help other people. And that's definitely the case with with both of us is is knowing what we know now and wishing we'd had access to that. We want to get out and when a kid comes in, it doesn't matter what level a kid's at. If the kid's at a three, it's like, you know, we want to get you to a five. And then, you know, maybe 18 months later, he's at a five, let's get him to a six and a half or a seven. And then a year later, before you know it, the kid's at an eight or a nine and he's come a long way. And that's what, that's what our, our goal with the academy is. Um, anything else we want to add in there? Oh, look. You know, we were young ones too. We, we remember what it was like. If someone told us how much work we needed to do at that age, I could understand how it feels like it's too much, but um, that's why we try to relate with the athletes as much I, as we can. You know what, and it's interesting because I'm, I'm a little bit weird. That's fine. I'm a little bit different. I wasn't that way, but what I wish I'd been exposed to, which is what we're telling these boys now, is is because I trained really hard. I naturally didn't have any gifts at all. I wasn't slow. Sorry, I, I was slow. I wasn't fast. I wasn't fit. I wasn't strong. I did get some height, which came really late for me, um, but I didn't have any of those particular gifts, but I did train a lot. Um, uh, but I didn't even realize I could, have, I could have doubled the workload. And it wasn't until I got older and I started to read, you know, you read biographies from, from different athletes and you realize, oh, like a human being's capable of working that hard. Yeah. And it resets the level um, for what you think a human can do and what is an acceptable level. Uh, and this is what we've said, like, you know, another reason that we set up the academy is because we've seen how often the, uh, the different clubs, Sydney clubs, and we've had experiences in several, yeah. how bad a job they do of developing their players and how much little resources, particularly now, goes into them to, compared to what they should be doing and how much little work the boys are putting in. Mm -hmm. um, again, if we look at a typical Harold Matt side, they might be in their off-season, they might be training three days, some of them might do four, but they might train three days for two, two and a half hours. So maybe they're putting somewhere between six and nine hours in a week and they think, oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm training, I'm doing well. Well, you know, like uh, my daughter is eight and she's in a gymnastics program and she's doing like three, three hour sessions a week. She, and she's eight and these kids are 16 and she has no prospect of, of, or very, very little prospect of building a career out of this. There's a very, very small amount of people that can go to the Olympics for gymnastics. Um, and there isn't a professional league for it. There's, whereas there is a massive professional league for this with 17 next year, a year or two after that, there'll be 18 professional teams and everything that goes along with it. And they're putting in nine or 10 hours a week. And so the thing that we're trying, we're trying to set a new standard. You know what, if you put in 20 or 25 or 30 hours a week, you can blow past a lot of those kids. Like what Chris was, he was talented and gifted and he trained hard when he was there, but that's all he was doing. Um, you know, if, if, if he walked into our academy right now um, with his ability and his talent and, every, and that work ethic to work when he wanted to work and then we added this in and we started to change his mind, you can do amazing things, huge things, but you've got to put in the work. Um, so most of the junior clubs, they don't, they set the standard pretty, pretty low and, it, and they keep it even lower for, for, which is another, it's a frustration because um, we've got kids that are in these programs 
And when they see, oh, such and such, I'm not going to mention any names, but you've got a super gifted, talented kid who rocks up and does the bare minimum, and the clubs tolerate it. The clubs let them act like that. The clubs don't hold those, those super talented kids to account because they can play football. Um, and it's not going to be until, until we get it where every single player has to work at this level, that's when you're going to really start to see what the game um, can look like. That's when we're going to start to see what people are capable of. Some of those gifted players who in the past have done just enough to get by, when they're forced to train 20, 25, 30 hours a week just to keep up with the not so talented guys, we're going to see it's going to be a completely different ball game. Yeah. And that's our intent. That's our intent. With, with the academy. This. Yeah, is to raise the standard of each individual kid, but to raise the standard of yeah. the whole game starting right here. And there's other academies I know that have popped up. They're, they're in, in uh, Sydney, in New South Wales, and in Queensland. And they're all doing the same thing. They've got the same intent. And you know, that makes, you know, uh, I was talking to a parent the other day and they said, oh, you know, does it annoy you that there's competition? Is this like, no, like we all want to see the kids get better. We want to see them enjoy their footy more, stay in the game for longer. And we want to see the level of the game go up. Um, yeah. yeah, I think, I think that does us for today. All right, thank you very much. That is all we have for you today. Please subscribe on YouTube. Is it called follow spirit on Instagram? There we go. Um, so follow us on Instagram, subscribe on YouTube. Please send your questions in. The better questions and the more detail um, that you send. Actually, that wasn't too, that was actually fairly detailed. The more detail that you send on your questions, it makes it easier for us. So please don't be shy. Send it if you, you know, if you, if you don't want us to say who has sent the question, which is most of you, um, then you can say, don't put your name. We won't put your name. Um, we will see you in the next episode. Cheers.